Good afternoon, everyone. A very warm welcome to all of you. Thank you for uh, joining us today. Uh, many of you are uh, probably regular participants, and uh, for those of you who don't know about the series, uh, this is the Distinguished Lecture Series on Energy Efficiency, which uh, we have been organizing since May 2020. Um, so it's been almost two years. I think in these two years, we've missed a couple due to some festivals and so on, but uh, this happens on the first Monday of every month. Um, for between 4 and 5 uh, p.m. Uh, so over the last couple of years, we've had a number of uh, very, very uh, senior experts and uh, distinguished people joining us as part of uh, this program. Uh, we started off with uh, Mr. Ravichandan Purushottaman, who's the president of Danfoss India. And over time, we've had MD of Thermax, Mr. Unikrishnan, uh, Mr. Ranganath Ganfos Palms, uh, Dr. Ajay Mathur, uh, who was then uh, the director general of the uh, of Terry? Uh, we have had Mr. Brian Motherway, who was the head of energy efficiency at the International Energy Agency. Uh, we've had Dr. Rene Van Berkel, who's head of the regional office in India as part of UNIDO. Uh, we've had Dr. Noshad Forbes. Uh, we've also had uh, Mr. Abey Bakre, who's the director general of the Bureau of Energy Efficiency. We've had experts from World Bank. Uh, we've also had some donors uh, who extensively work uh, in the space of energy efficiency. And very recently, over the last uh, couple of months, uh, we've had Mr. Vikram Kasbaker, who's the executive director of Hero Motor Corp, and the Professor Rangan Banerjee, who's the director of IIT Delhi. And uh, today, joining this illustrious uh, list of uh, people who have been part of the Distinguished Lecture Series on Energy Efficiency, uh, today's uh, lecture number 22, uh, we have uh, Dr. Jay Asundi. Uh, and Dr. Rasundi is the executive director of the Center for Study of Science, Technology and Policy, CSTEP. Uh, many of you may already be aware uh, that CSTEP is one of India's leading think tanks. Um, and their mission is basically to uh, support and enrich policymaking with innovative approaches uh, using science and technology with the overall intent of uh, developing a sustainable, secure and inclusive society. Um, so, Dr. Jayasundi, like I said, uh, is the executive director at CSTEP, and he has been involved in a number of uh, areas um, ranging uh, from I IT, artificial intelligence, uh, to energy, discoms, and, and so on and so forth. He also spearheaded the creation uh, of the Center for Air Pollution Studies at CSTEP, and as we all know, air pollution is a huge uh, problem that is uh, pervasive all around the world and especially in India these days. Um, and he has also been responsible for the establishment of the artificial artificial intelligence center for social impact um, as a sector of uh, research at CSTEP. His uh, current research uh, interests include information technology for development and the development of decision support systems uh, for a variety of uh, uh, public policy uh, problems. Uh, so, uh, Dr. Jay is also currently mentoring a number of uh, teams across uh, different areas, which include climate, energy, and urban development, and hence, of course, uh, the relevance uh, for today's uh, uh, talk. Um, he's also a senior member of the IEEE, uh, and prior to CSTEP, uh, uh, Dr. Rasundi was a faculty in information systems at the University of Texas at Dallas. Uh, he holds a master's degree as well as a PhD degree uh, from uh, the Carnegie Mellon University CMU in Pittsburgh. And he's also currently, in addition to his current role at CSTEP, he's also an adjunct associate professor uh, in the Department of Engineering and Public Policy at uh, CMU. So without uh, any uh, further ado, Dr. Rasundi, I would uh, like to hand it over to you. Um, and my colleague will uh, make you the host now and you will be able to share your presentation. And while Dr. Rasundi is doing that, a quick uh, request to all our participants. Uh, if you have any questions during the course of uh, the, the talk today, kindly uh, post your messages in the Q&A uh, dialog box that you will find at the bottom or to the right of your screens. Uh, we'll take the questions um, at the end of uh, Dr. Rasundi's talk. Dr. Rasundi, over to you now, please. Thank you very much for joining us today. Uh, you are muted, uh, Dr. Asundi. Yes, thank you again. Uh, <laughs> let me restart. Uh, so good yeah. afternoon, good evening. Uh, oh, thank you very much for that very warm introduction, Nisha. Uh, it is an, indeed an honor to be part of this illustrious group of people that have been speaking about energy efficiency. Many of them are uh, role models and mentors for me. So I am feeling uh, in incredibly overawed by this uh, opportunity. But I thought uh, this is an opportunity that I should not uh, let go. So uh, let me let me uh, see if I can pull up the right presentation. Is 
Is this the right one? Uh, I think it's getting into full screen mode. Um, yeah. Yes, it is full screen. You can start now. Thank you. Okay, great. Uh, great. Uh, so uh, once again, uh, thank you very much. So what I thought I should spend a few minutes today uh, is to talk about India's energy transition uh, and the case for rooftop PV. So that's the, the major thrust of my uh, my talk. Uh, so I just give you a sense of how I'll be, go about this talk. Uh, I know I have about 30 minutes. Uh, I'll just give a very brief introduction to what C-STEP does, but then uh, segue into the context of India's energy transition that we have to be making. Uh, the notion of green buildings, I think you did have a very wonderful talk uh, in, in the past on green buildings, but I'll uh, get into a little more detail and provide a case for the decentralized energy generation and rooftop PV and how we could unlock this RTPV potential for cities and urban areas and, of course, a way forward. Uh, just to give you a brief sense of those who may not know, C-STEP is a not-for-profit uh, think tank. We work on various issues related to India's energy transition, uh, clean air for all, uh, sustainable secure futures and digital transformations. Uh, so as uh, Nisha pointed out, our mission is to enrich policy making with innovative approaches uh, using science and technology for a sustainable, secure and inclusive society. Uh, we are based out of two offices, one in Bangalore and in the National Capital Region, have about 110 employees uh, since 2000 and we've been around since 2008. And our focus has been on impact driven work. Uh, we do a lot of research, but we also try to ensure that we are trying to make uh, that impact. Am I audible? I think I'm okay. So, so just let me uh, give you a little bit of context uh, that I feel that is important for India, uh, our energy and our green transition that we got to be making. Uh, as many of you know, our current India per capita electricity consumption, I mean, not energy, but electricity consumption is just short of a thousand uh, units per capita per, an per annum. And uh, based on some of the uh, estimates or modeling estimates that we have made is that it is expected to rise to about 3,500 to 4,000 uh, by 2050. Uh, 2050 is one. At the same time, we have also committed to the 1.5 degrees centigrade mitigation target and hence the net zero uh, net zero targets by 2070. The prime minister announced it at the recent conference of parties in Glasgow. And based on that, uh, the other commitments we have made are that of 500 gigawatts of fossil fuel free capacity by 2030. This is quite a, uh, an ambitious task but something that we need to do in case we want to commit to the 1.5 degrees centigrade and the net zero by 2070. And I'll talk about that a little bit. Now, as you can see, we've done some modeling exercises at C-STEP. This is something that we do in terms of our sustainable futures. And we see that buildings form a significant fraction of electricity demand in all scenarios. We've, we've done a whole number of scenarios. And in the 2070 net zero scenario, we see that uh, the energy or the electricity can demand is going to grow from 40 to nearly 20, uh, 70 percent by 2050 and it is only expected to increase over this period of time uh, and you will see here that we've looked at various uh, uh, sectors from agriculture industry buildings transport uh, and even carbon capture storage which is something that we will need to do in the future we see this is the uh, estimated or the estimated demand increase over this period of time now, while we uh, or this group might be looking predominantly at energy, uh, an important aspect that we need to also look at is other aspects of consume, uh, consumption, because it's not necessary that if we solve the energy problem, we are safe. We also need to think about uh, issues related to, uh, you know, cooling load, the water footprint, the land footprint, and things like that, uh, including the air breathe we really need to be worried about all these factors and as you know we are also working on air pollution so that's something that we are need to worry about so we need to think about all of these things simultaneously with that uh, background in mind uh, one of the things that i thought we should really focus on given that buildings are an important aspect we need to really think about the no notion of green buildings and as all of you might be aware that 
Green buildings as a concept is great. It creates a positive impact on our climate and natural environment. It has a minimal impact on our built environment as well as our natural environment. Uh, we also try to come up with environmental friendly and energy efficient, not just construction, but also use practices. And finally, the idea is to reduce waste and emissions. Uh, so in the perspective of the design principles that go behind green buildings, uh, I think site selection planning is the first step. Then, of course, building material selection, which really will define the embodied energy that goes into particular buildings. Uh, as you have heard from many talks uh, and the McKinsey Global Institute report, which says that 70% of our built area is yet to be built. So these uh, two criteria will play a significant role in how much energy we will spend in our buildings going forward. Then comes the issue of building envelope design in terms of defining how the building is de decided has a big impact on cooling loads. Uh, and then, of course, you have energy efficient measures uh, issues related to uh, either cooling systems, uh, heating systems, uh, double play pane uh, windows, various energy efficiency, even even appliances come into play here. Uh, then the aspect that I did talk about on water and waste, making sure that we minimize that we get into efficient, uh, efficient lighting. And as many of you are aware of the green business uh, certification or green building certification, these are all aspects related to that. And finally, we get into the last part, uh, which is that of RE integration. So this, uh, so my talk is going to focus only on the last part, which is about uh, RE integration. Uh, and this is where we would like to make a pitch that uh, there is a case for decentralized energy generation and rooftop photovoltaic systems. As I mentioned earlier, buildings account for 40% of India's uh, total consumption expected to rise going forward. We believe that rooftop photovoltaics is an elegant solution for building e electricity demand. Uh, it's a best fit for green buildings. Uh, it's a decentralized nature, and it also assists DISCOMs in addressing surge in electricity demand as we have been seeing in the last few days with the heat wave. Uh, is it possible that we can use rooftop photovoltaic systems to uh, uh, reduce the energy consumption and uh, and all, or in electricity demand and in, in, in a way address the surges that might come from it. Uh, it also reduces the large land, water and transmission requirements that will be needed if we have to meet these electricity demands. Uh, as you know, roof, uh, sorry, photovoltaic systems or solar parks require huge amounts of lands. Uh, usually there are large amounts of conflicts I think uh, you will know better than me on some of these issues. And finally, of course, uh, uh, without saying it, uh, it also helps reduce greenhouse gas emissions. So this is sort of our position is that India can accurately map RTV potential of cities with aerial surveys using drones and LIDAR. And this will not only promote green buildings, but also help our country achieve the ambitious solar targets or fossil fuel free targets that we have set for ourselves. So what is the current problem? I mean, why is it not happening already? Why do we need a special push? Uh, we have seen a very tepid growth across India in terms of uh, rooftop PV. Uh, as you know, we've got uh, the uh, India will likely achieve the 175 gigawatt target that we have set for ourselves for 2022. But we find that the installed capacity for rooftop PV is only 9 gigawatts as against to 40 gigawatts, which was the target. Uh, so what is going on? Uh, one of the biggest issues is the fact that many people complain about the uncertainty in payback associated with installing rooftop uh, systems. Uh, there could be issues related to shadow from adjoining structures. You have a building, you, you're not sure how much a uh, shadow of the uh, next door building or next door structure is going to have on your generation. So there is an unclear business case in terms of how much will be generated and how much you would benefit from it. At the same time, there has been a lot of policy uncertainty too. Uh, there's net metering, gross metering, uh, various issues related to that, which the DISCOMs uh, come into play. So hence, uh, what this leads to is this lack of clarity in process and various issues associated with rooftop PV that leads that is the and the result is tepid growth across India. So what is the solution that we uh, sort of brought into play here was that of what we call Crest Three Steps Rooftop so Evaluation Tool for Solar. 
And the idea here is we do instead of, so the traditional way on which rooftop solar is installed is you'll uh, call a developer, a developer will come, uh, map out your roof, you'll have a good understanding of your roof, uh, do some analysis uh, through various tools available and come up with a business case for that. Uh, as you will see, to do it over large urban space, it's going to take a lot of time, a lot of effort. And so this is where we come with the idea of coming up with high resolution imagery to account for shading aspects. So this is something that we can simulate. We can simulate 365 days of the year where the sun moves north to south, east to west. And we can get an accurate potential uh, estimate of how much energy can be generated from each roof. And we can inform the consumers directly about this particular feasibility. So each individual consumer now has the ability to decide whether that is uh, it's suitable for them or not. And then finally, another thing that this could also do was help the discoms aggregate capacity across a large group of people and, and provide third party uh, uh, assistance to them. Uh, so this is where I will talk about two interesting projects that we did. One is we use light detection and raging LIDAR, uh, where we uh, mapped the entire city of Bangalore in 2017-2018 uh, over this period of time. And it was the first of its kind of uh, project in India where we did our RTPV potential assessment. We mapped about 1,076 square kilometers in the city of Bangalore, and which effectively led us to find out uh, a potential of almost 2.8 gigawatts uh, on 8 lakh or 800,000 rooftops. Uh, as of now, 12 megawatts have been installed uh, using our tool, uh, and the DPRs have been for government buildings and uh, 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 BMTC depots. Uh, we have also signed an MOU and NDA with BESCOM to get some of the information related to cons uh, consumers, and we are also a technical knowledge partner for BESCOM RTPV implementation program. This is one. The second one we are currently ongoing is the drone based aerial imagery work in Madhya Pradesh, uh, where we have covered the cities of Bhopal, Sanchi, Indore, Gwalior, and Jabalpur, which is approximately 600 square kilometers. We have signed an MOU with uh, the MPP MCL. And again, we are a technical and knowledge partner for the, for the energy department's RTPV implementation program. Uh, so, what does this do, right? So, what is the program all about? Uh, the idea is that after doing the mapping, we develop a tool called the RTPV Decrest tool. And this is a web-based tool where it assesses the rooftop potential. The consumer can use this tool to uh, estimate or look at the potential of their own building or uh, own roof. Uh, the, the, the DISCOM will can look at it for the potential for the entire city. And, you know, even urban planners can use these for data sets for research. Um, the idea is that it maps every roof. So I will get into some of these details in a little bit. So what were the outputs of the LIDAR exercise? Uh, this is what we would call a point cloud. Uh, this is from the mapping of the LIDAR that mapped the entire city. Uh, you will see that when we look at this, uh, this is a point cloud. Uh, each of these points are put together. The resolution is in the order of anywhere between 5 to 15 centimeters. So it's fairly fine grained. We are able to map the entire area and we also take aerial imagery. So you'll see this imagery. Those of you from Bangalore will know uh, what part of, the, of town this is. And over this, we overlay the sun or the, the solar insulation on each of the roofs that are available in the city. And you will see from this, we can go to individual buildings and individual buildings, we can go ahead and estimate the rooftop potential in each of these buildings. So you will see there's a particular building. Many of you from Bangalore will be familiar with this building. You may have been to this building also. It is the Chaudhaya Memorial Hall where musical concerts are held. And you'll see that the rooftop capacity of such a building is about 18 kilowatts with the estimated payback period of only two years. So the expected re rate of return is very quick. Uh, given the amount of consumption, which is, you can see on the right, that is something that we also look at. We looked at the consumption pattern and we saw that given how much would be generated because of the net metering or the gross metering rates, you will be able to start getting money out of the system based on this particular area. So you'll see we have the ability to look at both of these. So this is uh, so this is uh, what, what I can do right now 
is, uh, uh, you know, uh, run. Let me see if I can, if this runs right away. Uh, can you see the screen? If uh... uh yes. Yeah. Okay. So, okay. So let me just. So this is the the, the, the this is the process by which the tool works. Uh, you have a, a person who registers. Uh, he registers his RR number from the. Uh, uh, puts it into the system, uh, gets an OTP in order to sign. So you obviously want only the person who uh, building it is to get that information. Uh, once the person signs into uh, the the system, it will take take the the tool will take you to your particular roof. You confirm that that is indeed your roof, and immediately the calculation will start. You choose the parts of the roof that you would want to install the uh, rooftop uh, solar photovoltaic system. It will show you your consumption based on the information that we have from the, uh, the DISCOM. And so I'll just, I'll just let this run through. And so once you hit submit, it will do the calculation and show uh, where do you need to put the solar panels on your roof. And then you'll see the calculation on the economics on the right side, where it will tell you the total capacity, how much you will generate over the uh, period of the year, what the total system cost will be based on uh, the system that you need to put, put in. And you'll see in this particular case, the payback period is five years and with a capacity utilization factor of almost 17%. Uh, and so this is uh, uh, this is the way in which this tool particularly uh, works. Each individual consumer can actually use this tool uh, to look at their business case, see whether this is something that they uh, like. Is is five years a good enough period of time? Uh, and uh, they will also see, okay, this is something, and then also look into details on what the expected generation is going to be over this period of time. As you will see, there are certain months it's more than others. Uh, April, May is usually the highest months of generation, uh, and uh, and then it uh, uh, the calculations are available. Uh, it you can also change. Uh, uh, certain things you can say, well, I only want to put a 20 kilowatt system. The system will tell you where to place the solar panels on your roof to maximize uh, uh, utilization. And you'll see in this case, the, the payback period drops to almost three years or four years. Uh, the other uh, part of the tool also allows you to say that I want to define the areas where I want to put the panels on my roof. Uh, you know, in this case, let's say there are only these two places that I want to put the panels. And uh, once I do that, it will tell me what the potential in each of these areas is. As you can see, the, uh, the, the total capacity has dropped from the earlier value of almost 25 to down to 8. But you will see that the capacity utilization factor has gone up and the payback period has, of course, uh, fallen to just four years. And this is the cost of various components. Uh, that are also made available to the user. And so that is the essence of uh, uh, this particular uh, tool, uh, essentially giving uh, the power in the hands of the consumers in order to uh, 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 in order to make decisions on their own uh, uh, in order to make decisions on their own when it comes to uh, uh, rooftop PV systems. Let me see if I can. Uh, so, so that's the essence of, of of the tool and how it works. I can talk a little more about that. Of course, many of you can go to the website and see a demo uh, right there. The website is up here. Uh, so, the question then also comes up across. Oh, this must be quite expensive. What does it mean? Uh, so, in in some ways, let me tell you the light detection and rangering work that we did in Bangalore covered about almost thousand one hundred and seventy six square kilometers. Uh, there are about 800,000 rooftop polygons. The total spend uh, that we spent on this particular exercise was almost about uh, 4 crore rupees, which comes to about 35,000 rupees per square kilometer. But if we look at the RTPV potential estimation from cost per rooftop using Crest is about 50 rupees. But if we were to do it with the help of developers, it will be almost 1,000 rupees 
per roof. Uh, so there's a there's a great reduction there uh, on the drone based aerial imagery that we are doing currently in Madhya Pradesh. We have found that when we did something where uh, about four square kilometers rooftop polygons of about 4029. It comes to almost 17,000 rupees per square kilometer where the cost is about 17 rupees as opposed to 1000 rupees. So as you will see that the cost of mapping rooftop PV uh, potential using crest is only 5% using lidar, 2% using drone based compared to about 1000 rupees charged by developers. Uh, why do we need to do this? We need to scale up so that it does. We, we do it faster. We need to have a transformative effect. We need to meet targets much faster. So we need to scale up and that will help reduce costs. It can also lead to what we call faster RTPV adoption because we will, can look at areas that we would have not looked at otherwise. And there's also an objective measure that's now available to people who want to finance uh, uh, people who want to finance these kinds of uh, systems. And finally, of course, uh, our ultimate goal is to reduce GHG emissions uh, from the building sector. So uh, I think with that, I would like to, uh, uh, you know, uh, leave with a, 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 you know, a pitch for collaboration or an invitation uh, to collaborate with us as we uh, strengthen our efforts to increase adoption of RTPV across the country. As I mentioned to you, we are doing Bangalore. We are looking at uh, doing Madhya Pradesh hoping to do more states in India now. Uh, I think uh, we need to look at more and more states uh, and drive uh, India's energy transition to a decentralized and decarbonized future. And all of this scale uh, and impact is so that we can create uh, a sustainable, secure and inclusive society. Uh, you know, I would like to uh, apologize if <laughs> I have uh, uh, rush through this presentation a little too quickly, but I'm actually very keen to uh, have a qu question and answer to explain more what uh, we can do uh, with regards to this particular uh, problem that we have in hand and how we can uh, take it forward. Thank you so much. Um, We've started getting questions, so what I'll do is uh, maybe uh, bunch some of them uh, together uh, so that, you know, we have. Uh, Should I stop sharing or do you think I'll need the slides for anything? Uh, you could maybe leave the slides on in case there are some specific questions okay. uh, for the slides. Uh, but, uh, you know, a, a broader perspective, uh, Dr. Asundi, in, uh, I mean, you already mentioned some of these issues, especially with uh, regard to a policy. Uh, there is no stability in policy, net metering, gross metering. Policies change every year, which means that people do not really have a long-term view uh, in terms of you know, how they manage their costs and uh, benefits. Um, so what would be your suggestions uh, for states in India? Maybe the top two or three suggestions uh, to increase rooftop uh, PV penetration. So, uh, so as, 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 as is very clear from this particular uh, uh, presentation, uh, you know, the DISCOM plays a very, very important role uh, in the adoption of rooftop PV because there are two things. One is, of course, uh, for households, uh, there are what, what we would call net metering, net metering rates. And then, of course, there is the uh, gross metering rate. So I think one of the things is that uh, a, a big indicator here is to make sure that there is... Uh, uh, policy stability. Uh, I think states and their discoms should definitely look into providing policy stability, if not for a period of three years, but maybe a period of a year or, or two years so that people can then take decisions and decide to install. Uh, that's number one. Number two is uh, have a single window process by which uh, people, when they apply for rooftop PV systems, uh, it is approved in a in a fairly transparent and a quick manner. I think that is a very important aspect. Uh, and, and I think the third part is uh, sometimes there is a disconnect between saying nationally or internationally in terms of our ability to go renewables, but what we are doing in terms of policies when it comes to the nuts and bolts. And I think there needs to be some uh, meeting point uh, that has to happen there. And that is something that we are working on very keenly with the DISCOMs to ensure that 
the biggest concerns discoms have is this ability to uh, uh, you know they feel that they will lose a lot of business uh, and quite honestly i feel that given the growth expected in electricity consumption in building uh, i don't think discoms or our generation uh, utilities are going to be able to keep up with that growth in demand in the manner that we would need for a stable and a sustainable grid. Uh, and I think that is something that we have to really be worried about. And I think that is a place where uh, the DISCOMs, the, the states and the central authorities have to come together to come up with a viable policy and also a good financing mechanism. I mean, I think in some ways there is funding available out there for these kinds of schemes, these kinds of initiatives. After all, they're all uh, green financing in some ways. Uh, maybe there is an opportunity here that can uh, be used to make sure that it it gets the 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 push that it that it needs. Uh, sure, sure. Uh, so you just mentioned about uh, financing, right? Um, how better do you think uh, financial institutions, NBFCs, banks, and a whole lot of other people uh, can better, uh, you know, maybe plan? Uh, for for the future, you know, in terms of the products they offer, in terms of the business models uh, that would be viable as far as the financier as well as the user is concerned. Do you have any thoughts on that? Yeah, so I think uh, one is, uh, uh, I, I think uh, while we have not spent too much time on the financing because we are trying to get the technical aspects of this uh, sure. issue uh, covered, but I, I do feel uh, there is an opportunity here uh, for us to actually jumpstart this, I would call this a revolution, because what it does is it actually puts in the hands of the consumer the ability to not only uh, generate their own energy, but also consume the energy when they feel is more, uh, you know, as they say, shaping the demand curve. Now, in terms of financing, I think uh, there are two aspects that can come into play. One is understanding what the targets we are going to be setting for rooftop PV over the next eight years, right? I'm talking in 2022. By 2030, uh, the Prime Minister has said 500 gigawatts. The question is, how much are we going to say is going to be the RTPV target? Uh, that said, I think the financial institutions can then estimate what the cost of that is going to be if you look at it today and say okay it is going to be about 50000 rupees per kilowatt uh, or it could be even less than that you know you estimate by based on that you will have a fairly good sense of how much is going to come up in how much time uh, and i think creating products or packages that will be attractive to homeowners users the big advantage that you have today now with the tool like this uh, this crest tool is that uh, that the the financiers can also look at person's roof and say does this make sense or not uh, you know so the biggest concern most people have is in terms of valuating when somebody comes and says i want to buy something because it's going to be a business case the question is uh, whose numbers are you going to believe are you going to believe uh, an independent body's numbers or are you going to believe a, a number that was given to you by some uh, vendor whose interest is to put the panel on the roof without any concern for whether it will actually meet the requirements. I think a tool like this can play a major role mm -hmm. in uh, uh, you know, uh, providing the necessary information uh, to make those kinds of investments. So I think it's a win-win it's a situation in this, in, in, this, in this regard. Sure, sure. So, um... Have you given any thought? Uh, I mean, this need not necessarily be a part of your work with the tool. Uh, but overall, since we are talking RTPV, uh, do you think there are any innovative business models which could come up, uh, you know, over the next few years, making use of the tool or not? However, it is. I mean, it could also be an independent thing. But uh, is it, what kind of innovative business models do you think should come up, or do you foresee coming up? And, you know, on a related basis, uh, uh, connecting this to the discoms also, uh, does it make sense for the discom to uh, perhaps uh, uh, in some way, uh, perhaps as part of the business model or otherwise, take some of this burden of for the consumers of the cost, uh, the burden of the cost of the consumers? Uh, absolutely. In fact, uh, this is something that we are uh, uh, actu exploring with discoms uh, is this issue of uh, one is, of course, uh, 
on bill uh, financing. Uh, that mm -hmm. is the ability for uh, uh, where the uh, uh, what what could happen is a third party. So let's say I have a roof, but I do not have the ability to invest and and put a panel on my roof. Uh, this is where a third party could come in and maybe monetize a whole number of roofs, not just mine, but maybe many other roofs and provide me power at a particular rate. And that now starts becoming a way in which, uh, you know, the business could benefit. So basically, they can get financing uh, and use that as a business case to now provide me with power over a particular period of time uh, at a particular rate. And whatever I don't consume, that entity is able to sell back to the grid and, 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 and produce uh, uh, revenues out of that. Uh, that is definitely an innovative uh, business model that we are considering. Uh, there could be other ways in which uh, certain sets of roofs can then be used to provide power to uh, consumers that are uh, poor consumers. Uh, there are there's a lot of financing available again for renewable energy for poor consumers. That could be another. And then of course, you know, steadily the idea is that uh, keep getting uh, more and more consumers as the growth happens. I think uh, vehicle electrification uh, is a is a concept that we have not really wrapped our brains around our heads around. Uh, it's gonna be a huge factor in consumption. Uh, if you think of all, our entire oil bill being replaced by electricity in some ways, uh, it's gonna be a huge amount. I don't think uh, we will be able to handle it in the way we are uh, looking at it traditionally. And that is something that we really need to uh, think about uh, when it comes to uh, 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 we, we really need to start thinking about. So these are various uh, innovative ideas that could come across largely to do with, I would say, financing and figuring mm -hmm. out in ways in which people can be provided energy access at a, as a, fa at a fairly cheap rate. Right, right. Uh, now, if you were to look at, uh, you know, the broader picture of transition itself and uh, not perhaps not just solar PV, but overall energy transition, uh, uh, and of course, solar PV as well. But uh, one one of uh, a, a very key uh, part uh, would be while there's a lot of uh, uh, you know push, etc. What about the pull factor? You know, uh, so if you, for example, look at uh, consumer behavior, uh, you know, a lot of it also. Uh, I mean, a lot of consumers are not really aware of you know all of these green things, right? They it's just electricity for them, right? But how do you uh, you know? change things on the consumer front where the behavior itself changes to demand a certain mix in their electricity, for example, or a certain type of service, which is green. So, uh, and that is probably the most difficult aspect uh, irrespective of, you know, which part of the green element uh, that you consider, green buildings, green electricity, whichever it is. So, do you have any um, suggestions on, you know, specifically on the consumer behavior? How do we change it? I mean, it's a long-term thing, of course, but what would be the first baby step to change it. Nisha, you, you're, you're now touching upon not a million dollar, not a billion dollar. This is a trillion dollar question. <laughs> that is, how do we get people to start taking into account that climate change is real, climate change is here, and I need to change my behavior in whatever small way in order to start making an impact towards climate change. And I think this is the sort of the holy grail of, I would say, climate change, climate change financing and climate change uh, uh, action or climate action, as they call it. Uh, so to that said, I think the pull factor is the biggest thing, because I, let me tell you, nothing is going to happen unless there is a pull factor. There's no amount of push that we do, no amount of tool development that I do, no amount of flying, no amount of working with DISCOM. No amount of this is going to work unless we have individual uh, people coming and saying, yes, I want to put a rooftop PV on the roof. I want to do this. I want to be green. Now, as always, early adopters will always be the people who will bear the brunt of all kinds of problems. But that is something that they are willing to bear because that is in their consciousness. They are looking at it from... Uh, I am a conscious citizen. I need to think about climate change. I need to think about the future and do this. And I think this is where we are starting to look into how do we essentially communicate 
to the citizens how do we get to more and more people to understand this particular factor and not look at it from the penny pinching oh am i going to get my payback period is seven years or oh, it is too high it is too low uh, today your uh, fd rates are fairly low <laughs> you know your payback periods are pretty pretty small uh, i think uh, you're better off putting a rooftop pv on your roof than putting that money in the bank as an fd so i think uh, we need to start a campaign of sorts uh, it is and this campaign which is why i it's a uh, it was a call to everyone here it's not just about uh, me telling uh, industry it's also i go around telling other consumer welfare people who are sit i mean everyone here are citizens too i think it has to pervade our society in a way that everybody feels responsible everyone feels okay what can i do this is one of the steps that you can do i mean there are many other steps i will not get into that but this is definitely one of the steps that people can do especially people who are head of households people who make decisions on their buildings can say you know what can we look into this uh, even though it means an investment of whatever it is maybe we can do that uh, and then of course uh, innovations and in, in business models can also happen but but you're very right i think pull factor is the most important thing uh, we have to build that awareness that people will say yes uh, this is what that this is what needs to be done you are muted this yes. happens all the time sorry um I, so, so uh, there are a lot of people you know you did mention about uh, one of the things uh, you mentioned was that uh, you're looking for partnerships and you know perhaps to see interest in people for the store so there are a lot of questions on that and a lot of people are talking about them being located in particular cities and uh, you know if they yes. can access the tool uh, so uh, I would assume that yes, it would be available irrespective of which city you are in. You should be able to use it irrespective of which city you are in. But um, would you like? Yeah, to no. So, so I actually, so this is this is one thing, right? So while uh, as a think tank, we started with uh, showing the proof of concept. Uh, I think it is important that we have a, me a mechanism by which we can show people that uh, uh, this is how it can be done and it can be done quickly. I think the, that was the biggest concern when we first started out. Uh, the second part where that we, that we are uh, really keen to do is, now that we have shown how this can be done, we want partners and people to come in and say, okay, I want to do it for this city. I want to do it for that city. Let us figure out a way in which this can be done. Uh, and I think that is where the bigger partnership is about. Uh, we, are, we are a not-for-profit think tank. Uh, we are not going to be uh, become a Tata or a Mahindra where we are going to be operating in every city. Uh, we want to actually build an ecosystem of partners who will help us uh, join. And tomorrow, if we need to do a, a city in 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 Jharkhand or in uh, you know Uttar Pradesh, uh, we should have a partner that says, "Hey, th these guys have developed the the, the SOP, uh, and we just take the SOP and apply it in a new place." We will be happy to be the knowledge partner and help with this particular activity. But, uh, it, you know, information is free for all. We, we want more people to use this because we believe that uh, the, the, the goal here is uh, we are not making any money out of this. We are, the goal here is to make sure this happens. And I believe that many of the entities here should be making money out of uh, something like this. They should. It's a great business opportunity. Sure. Uh... Uh, last few questions, maybe two, three questions, and you just used that word business opportunities, and uh, that was actually my next question. Uh, if you if you look at energy transition, uh, you know, um, from a broader perspective, again, not just solar PV, but uh, overall energy transition, um, what do you think could be the business opportunities, the top three business opportunities for uh, not just large companies, but also small guys, entrepreneurs, you know, startups. What, what do you think would be the top three business opportunities uh, in energy transition for a range of companies? So, so I, 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 will, I will talk in terms of short term, medium term, long term. Uh, mm -hmm. I think in the short term, uh, I do believe a um, lot of this renewable energy transition that we are uh, trying to get at. Uh, where we are trying to look at people moving uh, and, and installing. So rooftop PV is one of those systems where both ends of the spectrum, you have the small developers, players who work in certain neighborhoods, 
as well as the large developers, right? You know, the, the, the Tata's and, you know, the, the, the big companies can also be participating in that. So that is, this is one of the things that's highly democratic. Uh, you also have the opportunity of uh, employment generation or livelihoods in smaller places, because now you're looking at decentralized form of energy generation. You have people who come and maintain and do some sort of work in various local neighborhoods. So there's a lot of opportunity there. So that is, uh, you know, one area on rooftop EV. Uh, Attached to that is one of the things that we are seeing now is this whole issue of uh, electrification uh, of transport. As we electrify transport, there's going to be opportunities there for charging infrastructure to come into place, uh, be it the small charging infrastructure. I think some of the companies that are coming up with vehicles with swapping infrastructure for batteries. Uh, the question is that how are you charging those batteries? If you charge them using some renewable form of energy, so much so better. So that's the what I would say the decarbonization of our transport sector can be also done through that. So that is the other, but that's also a, a midterm or a midterm uh, perspective. And then I think finally, when we get into the long term perspective, I think uh, you're looking at uh, opportunities of using uh, green hydrogen for various industrial processes. Again, for the big players, iron and steel, cement, uh, there's a lot of opportunity there now looking at how uh, hydrogen can be used for some of these things, but also how you transition to, you know, electrification of various sorts. And then at the smaller scale, it's going to continue to be uh, the rooftop photovoltaic systems or the, you know, the, the decentralized energy systems, uh, even in terms of energy efficiency, in terms of uh, more uh, newer cooling systems that are likely to come up. I mean, we are definitely looking at more and more heat waves going to happen. Uh, I don't think it's sustainable for us to think about air conditioning the way we are today. We'll have to think about better ways of cooling action, what we call providing thermal comfort, uh, looking at new technologies as, as a company that we do. We do look at a lot of new technologies that are over the horizon that can be applied. Uh, we have a technology assessment framework where we try to apply these assessment frameworks to new technologies to see what the potential is for India. I mean, some technologies may not be as good for India as for other countries. But, and so we do, we do look at those aspects also. So these are some of the ideas that we have in place. Uh, mm -hmm. I, I do feel, uh, you know, renewable energy is, is a great opportunity here to uh, democratize or, you know, provide incentives to a whole host of people, be them small players, be them large players. I think uh, the system is going to be large enough that it, it, it will be able to accommodate a, a lot of people in the process. Okay. Okay. And uh, what are your thoughts on, uh, you know, international learning? Are there any countries that you think, uh, you know, uh, we could learn something from? Are there uh, technologies internationally available that uh, you think we should look at in terms of technology transfer? Any, any thoughts on that? You know, there's always, there are always technologies. I mean, you know, you look at cooling technologies, there are a lot of things coming up uh, on the horizon, same with uh, hydrogen, uh, same with carbon capture storage. I think there's also a lot of projects going on in India. I think India is also working on a, a bunch of these things. Same goes with battery technologies. I think these are a whole host of technologies that uh, definitely we can learn from. But I will uh, try to push one thing, uh, though, is that if we jumpstart this rooftop PV uh, revolution, if I may use that term, I think we have a lot to teach the world. Uh, uh, today in America, there is something or in Europe also, uh, there are a few cities that have what is called the Google sunroof program. Uh, but let me tell you that the, the program or the tool that we have developed is as good, if not better than the Google sunroof program. So this is something that I think we in India uh, should be teaching to the rest of the world and maybe helping uh, other developing countries. I think it's time we also help other developing countries, uh, maybe in Africa where energy use is very low. We should definitely look at how they can uh, leapfrog. They don't need to go through the coal route. Can they go through the renewable route with our help uh, going forward? So again, there is a business opportunity for many of the companies here that could see this as an opportunity of learning in India and then applying it to those places. Uh, I believe that if you learn in India, you can apply it anywhere in the world. Sure, and uh, thanks for bringing that perspective, you know, because we always talk about 
uh, how can we emulate our countries? How can we learn from other countries? But we don't really think about how do we take our learnings to other countries. So that that was a definitely an interesting perspective. Thanks. And the final question, I think, um, you know, again, looking at energy transition as a very uh, big, uh, uh, you know, uh, area for not just India, for uh, all countries across the world. What do you think uh, would be uh, the the biggest three things that India as a country, as a government, you know, should do uh, to ensure that we move in the right direction? So what would be the first three things to be done over the next, say, five years, which will set the path uh, for the broader energy transition in the country? You know, I, 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 I'm not going to be saying anything that you have not heard before. So uh, let me. But let interesting me just, to get different perspectives on. Yeah, this, let, so. let let me let me repeat some of the things that you because you know I, I don't want people to think that oh he didn't say anything new. Uh, I think the first step, and I think this is one thing I will uh, like to say a little different from what most people say. One is I think uh, let us be clear about one thing uh, that uh, our sustainable development goals. Uh, in terms of, uh, you know, uh, achieving what I would call quality of life, a decent quality of life for all our citizens should be paramount in any discussion. I don't think there should be any negotiation on that. I don't think we can tell a poor person that, look here, we cannot give you this particular lifestyle or this particular quality of life because we have run out of carbon space. I think that is uh, unacceptable. I think we have to very much look at it from the perspective of providing a decent quality of life to all our citizens. That said, I think there is also here an opportunity for us to look at it from a slightly more uh, a different lens from a sustainability point of view. I don't think we need to Everybody does not think about a white picket fence and a big house in the way, you know, the American dream is or the European dream is. I think there is a notion for us to now step back and say, what is an Indian dream? What is an Indian aspiration? What is it that we uh, treasure and, and want for our people? And I think that's a very important perspective that we should have when we think about uh, energy or this transition that we are talking about. Uh, it could mean that uh, maybe many houses are built in traditional manners in in tradition using traditional materials. It need not be just iron, cement, and steel. Yes, you'll still continue to have uh, cement, iron, and steel in places, but it not need not be everywhere. Uh, in in rural areas, it's not necessary that you need these uh, uh, houses, which then need air conditioning for cooling when we are going to have heat. I think we need to also think about various ways in which we can reduce our energy footprint, our, our material footprint, and think about it more from a sustainability standpoint, because at the end of the day, we've got only one earth, we've got only one country, and, and we have to try to use our resources as, uh, as uh, uh, useful as possible. So I think the biggest business opportunity that's going to come up in the next uh, uh, you uh, in the in the decade or two is this entire aspect of circularity or circular business how can we use the materials that we have and that can produce a circular economy use the uh, 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 you know uh, use the materials that we have for what we are doing and make sure that the we minimize the amount of waste because waste is just another place we are putting it uh, it's 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 like saying that we have a dustbin but i think at some point in time the dustbin is going to get full What's going to happen there? You can't throw it out, right? So it is part of it. I think we need to really think about some of these sustainability aspects uh, uh, very clearly. I think uh, definitely we are uh, on the on the right path. I think in this next ten years, we have to look at ways in which we can reduce uh, uh, consumption. I think uh, consumption not from a uh, which is over and above what we would call a decent quality of life. I think that's one of the things that we have to do and look at efficient ways in which we can provide value. I think at the end of the day, it's about providing value. When we get together with uh, our friends and family, we don't care so much about uh, is the temperature of the house or the room 21 degrees or 22 degrees or uh, you know 18 degrees as I've seen in many offices. Uh, we see whether it is reasonably comfortable where we can actually have a good time and share uh, 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 a good meal with our uh, uh, family members. I, I think that's a, that's a very important aspect there. So I think these are some of the things that uh, we need to really uh, start focusing on. And, you know, you did mention about it earlier. How do we provide the pull from people? 
And I think people, the people factor is very important. People have to say, look here, this is what I want. This is what I'm happy with. I don't need that, you know, that uh, 10,000 square foot house to be happy. I'm happy with that uh, 100 square meter place that is, is sufficient for my small family. And, 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 and it's, it's enough for what, what we need. And I think being, uh, uh, being content and making sure that you live a sustainable lifestyle is, is, is what it's going to be all about. I think that's going to be uh, what will define our track uh, in the next 10 years. I think we have been led astray to a large extent. Uh, India has had a lot of uh, sustainability has been part of our, uh, you know, we all talk about grandmother tales, right? On what, how they would use various materials again and again. I think we need to really look back to that and think about those traditional practices and how we can uh, define a better future for ourselves going forward. Thank you so much. Yes, and I'm sure that, uh, you know, whatever you just mentioned in the last couple of minutes, that probably resonates with many of us. So thank you so much uh, for that. So Dr. Asundi, uh, I think we've reached the end of the session. Would you like to uh, maybe say a few closing words uh, before we end? Well, I, I think I, I said what I had to say. I think it is a journey that we all have to uh, take uh, together. I really look forward to, uh, you know, partnering with all of you. I, I have come... I have come to believe, uh, as they say, uh, if you want, if you if you want to go quickly, you go alone. But if you want to go far, you have to go together. And I think we have a a long, long way to go. And I think it is all of us that have to come in together uh, and 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 go along. I I don't think it's possible for us to go alone. Uh, this is something that we have to go together. Uh, and I, and I think that that is the that is the mantra I will want to use here. Uh, uh, I would look forward to partnerships to uh, take this forward and and make it a success to to show to the world that we can show them the way. Thank you so much, Dr. Asundi, for spending the last one hour with us. I uh, I personally enjoyed it very much, and I'm sure that all our participants enjoyed this talk too and this discussion that we've had. Thank you very much, uh, and uh, we maybe hope to see if we can collaborate with you too sometime in the future. Thank you so much for joining Absolutely. us today, Dr. Asundi. Very thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. All. Bye bye. And to bye -bye. all our participants, we hope to see you next month on the 6th of June. Thank you. Bye bye.